Welcome to Making Waves Podcast with Tom Prather. I appreciate you being here. If you could, please let us know what you think in the comments or leave a review, subscribe, and please share. My goal is to encourage as many folks as possible to make waves in their lives and their businesses. So, you know, it all starts with us. On this episode, I am speaking with Ronnie Langley. Now, Ronnie took her love and skills for epoxy art and turned it into a hugely successful business and brand. I consider Ronnie to be the pioneer in realistic ocean wave art. Her stuff is amazing, and I myself am very proud to be an owner of a piece of her work. And uh, every time I walk into the kitchen, it makes me feel good. So there you go. And since we're all about making waves here, Ronnie is a perfect guest to share her story as an artist, businesswoman, and social media influencer. We also discuss mental health, relationships, and the importance of fathers in a girl's life. But before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about our sponsors. First, the iconic Britches Great Outdoors. Britches is known for their quality clothes, which are like outdoorsy, preppy, punk rock, and surfer all wrapped up in one. They brought the rugby shirt to America, popularized, did I say that right? Popular, that's a tough one. But they made the polo shirt famous and invented the world famous Warthog logo. With their unmatchable attention to detail, you'll feel the difference when you put it on. Right now, get 10% off your order with code WAVES. Just go to warthog.vip. Our second sponsor is Jesse Itzler's BYLR 30 Days of Excellence. If you've been living under a rock, Jesse is the successful entrepreneur that founded Zico Water, Marquee Jet, All Day Running, and owner of the Atlanta Hawks. Not to mention husband of Spanx, Sarah Blakely. Now every week, Jesse leads a live call with former NFL player Mark Brown and retired Navy SEAL and ultra athlete Chad Wright. This video call features some of the world's most brightest in their field, like Wim Hof, Jim Quick, Sanjay Gupta, and more to help you live your best life. Go to BYLR.com, get 50% off the first month just to try it out. All right, so it's now time to kick back and relax, except if you are driving, please keep your eyes on the road, drive safely. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ronnie Langley. Well, thanks for doing this. Of course. Um, I, you popped on, I'm sure a lot of people say this, you popped on my radar on Instagram. Yeah. And, um, I've just fell in love with the art immediately. And everyone that comes into the house that sees the, I don't know if you can see this or not. It's the, uh, this is what I bought. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I remember making that one. There's actually yeah. there's very few pieces I don't remember making when people show oh, them really? to me. And then, yeah, I have a good memory for each like piece I make, especially because yeah. the wood is always unique. So I remember making that one for you. Where do you source this wood? Uh, so that's, if I'm correct, that's olive wood. And I've got some local distributors here that kind of give me backdoor deals on wow. my wood here. Um, not recently since the prices are so insane. But oh, So the prices uh, have affected that kind of wood as well? Not just oh like, yeah, pretty much any type stuff. of wood um, okay. is just like it's not as bad as some of the other stuff that's really crazy right now, but yeah, it's not what it used to be. Well, I I tell you, when I walk in the kitchen and we don't use it, I mean, it just sits next to it sits on top of the other cutting board. And <laughs> we actually have used it as a cheese um, board, but um, yeah, I don't cut You're, on it or anything. I feel like they do well as display boards because you know yeah. it's. Awkward. You can use the back for cutting. That's what I always tell people. But like, oh. you know, it's for display. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, every time I walk in the room, it just makes me feel good inside. So I love it. Oh, I'm we, so glad. Uh, during COVID, my wife had her hairstylist come over, um, which I'm sure a lot of hairstylists did, house calls. Mm-hmm. And um, she, I mean, I got called. I wasn't even home. I got called to come home to give her your information. So I, I think, <laughs> I don't know if you're, if she caught your sales cycle, but she had, <laughs> she had to get the information. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. I love that. All right. Well, so I'm going to start off with the rapid fire questions. I hope you're ready. The rules I am are ready. you have to be committed. You can't waffle in the middle. 
Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Give me a second right. to collect my thoughts. Then. <laughs> uh, so dogs. I am ready. Dogs or cats? Definitely dogs. One hundred percent. Do you have any? I have one. Yes, her name's Natty. She's a Boykin Spaniel. Um, I got her in college as like a ESA type dog and took her with me to all of my classes in college. Um, okay. And now she's a big fat chunk that sleeps on my couch all day. Is it? St- is, is, is is it's a girl, right? Yes. Is she still a, a, a emotional support dog? She is. Yes. I just don't take her for public access um, as much as I used to. Uh, I had really bad anxiety in college, but okay. I've definitely learned some better techniques to combat that now. So I don't have to take her in public as often as I used to. Okay. Awesome. Um, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Rolling Stones or the Beatles? Uh, I think probably. Okay. So I'm not like a huge old music buff. I think I've yeah. probably heard more of the Beatles. So I'll go okay. with the Beatles. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Not sure if you drink sodas, but it's more of a brand I drink thing. Coke like it's my religion. Um, <laughs> and I think Pepsi is an insult to Coke. So absolutely 100% Coke. <laughs> you know, it's so weird. I don't ever, and I don't know if just I'm not looking, I never see Pepsi anything, like ever. But I will forget which fast food chains carry Pepsi and then get through the drive through and be like, oh, the Coke, they'll be like, is Pepsi okay? I'm like, I am so insulted you asked. Um, no. <laughs> Obviously, no, I do not it, act that way towards service industry people, but yeah, it ruins my day to have to accidentally get a Pepsi. It's so funny you say that because it Coke is just kind of like Kleenex, you know? You, it's soda is mm-hmm. called Coke now. And it's sad for Pepsi that <laughs> restaurants have to say that, you know? Yeah, people will send drinks back. <laughs> <laughs> Like I have, I'm not that way. Like if I get a Pepsi and was not warned ahead of time, I'm not going to make a fuss about it, but I also worked in service industry. So I don't make a fuss about anything, but I have definitely had friends who have like sent Pepsis back because it was not Coke. That is so funny. Uh, Beach or mountains. I think I know the answer to this. Yeah. You've got to know the answer to this one. Beach a hundred percent. Uh, PC or Mac. Mac. East or West. East coast. Okay. I have. I have lived East Coast my entire life, but I love the West Coast. So I am straight down the middle on that one. Lived here, love it. But every time I visit, I'm like, I should just move to California. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Kramer or Costanza? Um, Gosh, I don't even know if I can have an opinion on it. I don't feel like I know enough about them. All right. We've been um, um, we've been watching a lot of Seinfeld lately. I don't know why. Yeah. I'm getting my daughter into it and she loves it. So. Superman or Batman? Oh, Superman for sure. Last one, Kardashians or Osborns? E- neither. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, I am so excited to have you on. I've been a big fan for a while, and um, I'm just so curious. How did you start in art? Is this something that you you know you noticed or your parents noticed about yourself as at a young age, or was this something that kind of developed later in life? Um, kind of a little bit of both. So I was always very artsy. I did lots of elective art classes growing up in uh, my private school. So kind of just had fun with it. And I did the AP art classes, which ended up being a bad thing. So I took AP art classes thinking like, oh, this will be great. Like I can take the more advanced classes because I was a little more advanced in art anyways. But then when I got to college, because I had gotten college credit classes in high school for doing art, I realized I had disqualified myself from being able to take any art classes unless I declared it a major or a minor because I'd taken all the essentially like elective college classes. Hmm. And so I was planning to take um, elective art classes as filler classes in college and then ended up not being able to because I already had college credit classes for all the introductory levels. So, and I knew early on that I didn't want, I loved being an artist as like a hobby. I didn't love, I didn't want a, to get a degree in it. So I knew I couldn't declare a minor or a major. So I ended up, so I was very artsy growing up. And then there was probably like a four year period. I didn't pick up a pencil or paintbrush at all um, because I was in college focusing on my studies. And I was at all times having a full semester and a part-time job and usually internships. So I was very busy um, and had too much going on to be involved in art uh, like I used to have been. Mm -hmm. And so my last semester of college, I was coming out debt-free. I had worked really hard through college. um, And that last semester, I had 18 credit hours, which is the max you can have without um, getting like the Dean's approval, I think. So I had 18 credit hours and then I had an internship 
that was part-time and unpaid. And then I had a part-time serving job. Uh, and I was just like, not because of all my other obligations, I didn't have time to work as much as I needed to. And I was not making the income I needed. And I was super stressed out about bills and getting through college and just like finishing up strong without having to take out any loans. And so I was like, okay, I need something at home that I could possibly make money from that's going to be a de-stressor for me. So I decided I would start painting again. And I knew I grew up doing uh, pretty classic like oils and acrylics. And I knew that I did not have the time to do that. And I needed a quicker medium. And one of my um, ex-boyfriend's moms did uh, acrylic flow troll art. And her stuff was absolutely stunning. And I was planning to do it in a very different style than her. Um, But I contacted him, which we were still on really great terms and like really close friends. So I contacted him and I was like, hey, can I get your mom's material list? And he sent it over. And she used epoxy resin as her hardening top coat to protect her art. And I got confused and thought that she was using that as her main medium. And so I purchased um, God, like two gallons of it or something, which was just about the last uh, money in my bank account. <laughs> so I got a bunch of art supplies and then realized I had bought the wrong thing. I called the company which is not the company that I use now. It was a company that I had started with. um, And I was like, Hey, I'm so sorry. I bought the wrong product. Can I return this? And they were like, no. So I just had to figure out how to use it. um, And it all kind of developed from that one first mistake. (laughs) Well, going back to your idea of, I need to make more money. Let me do some art. Like what was the thinking process? Was there a plan for that? Cause. Oh no, absolutely not. (laughs) I could do art, but like, just like, for someone that's not a known artist, like what was your thought process of how would you even make money with doing art? Um, well, I my family is super supportive and kind and nice. I love my family to death, and I knew I could pawn off uh, guilt trip art on them. Got it. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and it was also mainly a hobby I was trying to pick up to de stress because I was so busy and I was making it through college debt free so far, but I was really stretching it that last semester to make it without having to um, take out loans or ask for help to pay my like rent and <laughs> be able to eat. And so I was really stressed about money and I was like, well, it'll be a little bit of an investment with the last money I have into like having something, but I have got to have something I can channel all this into so that I'm not just like, I didn't want to, if I get stressed out, because I used to have really bad anxiety when I would get stressed out, my grades would suffer and I was graduating on Dean's list. So I did not want to mess it up last minute. <laughs> so what I was, was like, your- I have the What was your major? Um, So I graduated with an English degree in technical communications. So I, excuse me, I was doing um, essentially the way that I describe it to people is I was doing IT translation. So I knew engineer language and could translate their speech and explanations of software uh, stuff. And then I could translate it into plain language. So I was writing manuals and things like that for software so that the everyday user could understand what the engineers intended when they created a program. Oh, wow. So I graduated. It, my technical degree was in English, but the job was IT. And I ended up getting recruited uh, by a IT comp- a pretty big IT company here in Charlotte um, about two or three months before I graduated. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, it was a lot. How did you stumble across the the epoxy wave art and and the technique of the of the heat gun and like where how did how did that happen lots of trial and error (laughs) um i didn't know anything about the medium partially just because it was very new to the art community in general when i started like i think there were two or three people doing it um and then also because i had gotten the medium wrong to start with i didn't i didn't know what i was using so i started in my garage which uh, do you work with epoxy resin at all? I, I have not touched it ever. Okay. So um, neither did I when I started. And what you absolutely need to know before you start working with it, but that I didn't know is that it is very temperature sensitive and it is a reactive chemical um, by its nature. It's a part A, part B chemical reaction. And I was working in my garage in summer in you know a hundred degree weather and you have to keep it below like 74. Okay. And so my art was like smoking and exploding. I was so confused, <laughs> um, especially because I thought I was working with acrylic flow troll, which everything I, I was trying to Google to troubleshoot why 
my art was on fire yeah. and everything was like, yeah, Floetrol should not be on fire. Not quite sure. Floetrol is essentially just a paint extender. Like it's like, it's like a white paste. You just add it to your paint and it takes on the color and then you have more of your paint. So there was no chemical properties to that that should be reacting. But everything I was Googling was about acrylic Floetrol because I didn't know I had the wrong product at that point. Um, and so lots of trial and error. I, once I figured out what I was working with and discovered that I was going to blow my house up if I kept doing it in my garage, I took it inside, got everything temperature controlled, bought some gloves and a safety mask. And then I tried out a bunch of different techniques. I did galaxy stuff for a while, which was a big hit. Um, I did nature series and kind of like abstract home decor and I did the ocean pieces here and there. And it was really just like, every time I did them, I was like, Oh, I love doing these so much more <laughs> than everything else. Um, but I was trying to keep my palette pretty diverse. And eventually I was like, you know, like I'm doing this for me. I'm doing it for like to de-stress and to be happy and doing this kind of art is what makes me the happiest. So I'm going to stick with the oceans. And, and I started narrowing it down, which ended up being a big contributor to my social media success because the, um, social media platforms thrive off of consistency. So mm -hmm. it ended up being a good thing for my platform that I was narrowing down to one niche technique and it was the one that I liked the best anyway. So it worked out pretty well. Was it, did you start always on wood? Um, I tried it on, um, I tried it on stone and resin does not adhere to stone. So that didn't work out. It, I finished and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's so pretty. And then it just fell off. And I was like, oops. <laughs> uh, I tried it on acrylic uh, plastic and same thing. It will not stick to acrylic unless you sand it down. Okay. And I tried it with glass and it doesn't stick to glass. <laughs> so there were lots of, I really did learn very trial and error to begin with. Um, but I stuck with wood. It sticks to wood well. And I just love wood as a medium. Like it's so gorgeous and so natural. I feel like it accents well in every home. Um, and you can get so many different species of wood and colors of wood where, yeah. you know, it'll match different decor. And I just, wood is just mwah, chef's kiss. We're, um, so I'm trying to figure out though, like you had the wood, you had the, you had the, the, the epoxy. Mm -hmm. How did that, do you remember the moment where the beach thing kind of came about in the oceans and like you could use the wood for the beach and you know the, like the the process of like how long where did it come from you think like do you remember the moment and then how long did it take to get to where you are now where you i would assume you have like a a system or a or a way that you go about it that you know how it's going to react ideally and yeah um well the the beach ideas just came from, well, I grew up going to the beach. That was always yeah. like my favorite thing. And I knew I wanted to do art that was reflected of nature. Um, and like, I like doing the ocean stuff the best. And then it just took me, I mean, I really did take a long time to get the technique down just because it is a very temperamental medium. Um, your environment is very contributory to how the art turns out and, so it just took a lot of trial and error. And then I would say it took me a year before I was getting consistent enough results that I was like, every time I sat down to do a piece, I was like, okay, I, I know how this will turn out <laughs> um, before. Cause it took me several, several, several months um, just shy of a year where every time I sat down, I was like, okay, well I'm going to do the exact same thing as last time, but who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> um, and it was just, you have to learn the medium and kind of master all the techniques. And there's, so many contributing factors that change the outcome, like your heat gun and your heat gun setting, but then also the angle that you hold your heat gun and the length of time that you hold it in one spot. And if you twitch your wrist a certain way, like it is so technical. Um, it just took me a while to get everything figured out. But once I did, it's almost like mes muscle memory now. Like I, I sit down to do things and I, I don't even really like think it just comes out. It sounds like a science project. It feels you know, like a science project. <laughs> yeah, like you're, you know, okay, what was the difference in this, you know, trial? Mm -hmm. And and it, it sounds pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, um, I mean, it does feel like that when you're doing it. During that year that you were kind of trying to figure this this out, um, were you working or you know, I'm you were I, doing I was, the okay. Um, so I was working, um, well, I started in college, of course, in that last semester. So it was that entire last semester. And then I got recruited by the IT company. I started working for them and it was a work from home position. So 
when I wasn't on projects, I was painting um, and doing lots of my trial and error there. And then I would probably only been working for them for maybe five months or so when I had a video. I had gotten on TikTok um, early back when everyone was making fun of people who were on TikTok. Uh, and so I had gotten on TikTok really early because I knew it was going to be really good for my business. And I was willing to take the criticism. And so I had a video go viral and it was pretty much over the course of maybe like a two week period where I had so many orders that I was like, I could probably quit my job and do this full time. And I had been doing it very part time, like almost no little to no income before that. And so I was like considering it and I liked my IT job, um, but I didn't love my IT job and I had always loved art, but I was a little apprehensive that if I turned my passion into my income source that it might take all the joy out of it. So I was a little worried about that, but I just kind of went for it. <laughs> I was fresh out of college, kind of feeling fearless, I guess, and wasn't too worried uh, cause I had my degree to fall back on if it didn't go well. And I had a really good relationship with the people at my IT company. So I knew that they weren't going to take it personally if I quit and that they would also, um, help me get another job and give me good references if I failed. Uh, so, you know, it was a risk, but it was a good risk to take and it worked out. So it was nice. <laughs> when did you know you had something, you know, once you made the leap, was it just the orders coming in? And the sustainability yeah. of it? Um, yes, I had so I had more orders than I could make an entire year um, come in in the course of two weeks because that video that had gone viral had, I want to say, 30 million views, something insane. Um, and all my videos before that had had like a couple thousand. <laughs> and so overnight, I just had like all this interest in my business and people following me and like sticking around and like multiple messages from people coming in like, Hey, when's the restock? When's the restock? When's the restock? And my store was sold out. Um, and so everything became really real, really fast. And thankfully by that time I had pulled, I had already before that had happened, had good working relationships with a few sponsor companies who had found me very early on when I was nothing and, um, asked to partner with me. And so I kind of just leaned into them and I was like, Hey, look, like I am in over my head. I don't know what I'm doing but this feels right. And it feels like something I have to do for myself and I need like mentorship and guidance. And so I really leaned in. Um, my main sponsor company, Moss Epoxy was like really, really good about helping me without it just being at the advantage of themselves. Like they helped me set up my website and showed me how to set up, um, like a payment system and things like that. And so, oh, wow. yeah, they were, they're a great company. Um, I love their products, obviously, but like outside of just their products, the people there are very kind and invested in me a lot early on, knowing that I had no clue what I was doing. And so I knew I had something because of the volume of interest and orders that I was suddenly flooded with. Mm -hmm. But then I felt sure enough to make that transition because I knew I had people behind me that were going to support me and help me and hold my hand while I did it. That's amazing. Cause I was going to ask like what kind of business background you had, but you had some great mentors that stood up for you and advocated. Yeah. I didn't have uh, pretty much any business background at all. My dad ran his own business. Um, so I got to see him do it when I was growing up, but his was like a, he was doing like real estate, okay. um, like construction and stuff. And so like very different business and you run those very differently, especially looking at a you know, 20 year difference in social media impact. And so I really didn't have, uh, any background in it, but the main social media coordinator, um, that does all their marketing and, uh, social media stuff was the person that I was in contact with at Mass Epoxy. And so yeah. he knew what he was doing and was more than happy to help me out. And I was just grateful to have some advice. Yeah, that's great. So during that year, it, it was it towards the end of the year that you realized this could be a, a, a valuable like side hustle for you prior to leaving the, the IT company? Um, so I, I didn't leave the IT company until I was sure. So okay. I would say it was, um, I'd been painting for, it was, I mean, it was really fast and this isn't how it goes for most people. I'd say I'd been painting for about seven or eight months when I transitioned to it being my full-time job. Okay. 
Well, that's so, incredible. Well, that's, in, I mean, yeah, and I was still, I was still within that year of trial and error where I was figuring it out too. So a lot of the first like four months where I was doing it full time was yeah. burning through money, taking on projects I wasn't ready for and having to do them several times before I got it perfect for the customer. Cause I wasn't going to send out something that wasn't done well, yeah. even if I had done my best at it. So it, it was still a lot of trial and error, but I knew I could make it full time and I was willing to make that leap and just like trust myself to make it happen. Okay. So I own a, a media production company, a video production company, uh, an agency. And, uh -huh. um, you know, I like to focus on like the branding aspect of businesses. So mm -hmm. in your case, you probably use social media. The It sounds obviously that you use mm -hmm. social, social media the most to create, you know, to build the business, create the business, you know, behind social media. What was your approach with social media? Was it was it, I don't want to say calculated, but was it, again, that was kind of a trial and error thing for you as well, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it definitely was. I, I honestly, I didn't really have a strategy. Um, the contact that I had over at Moss Poxy that was giving me lots of help was, um, he was definitely encouraging me like, Hey, involve yourself, involve your own story, involve your personality, because people like to feel connected to an artist as much as they like to feel connected to the art. And the way that he pitched that to me was he said, you are the brand, your products are just like merch. So what you want to sell people mm. is your story and your life and a small piece of who you are. And that's going to create a more long-term customer. So someone that likes your art is going to buy a piece and put it in their house and love it and never think of you again. But a person that likes you is going to come back and buy more things and be there with you through the progression of your story because they're not just invested in the single piece that caught their eye, they're invested in the creator. So if I, I didn't really have any technique or strategy in mind, but I did have in the back of my mind that I wanted to be involved in my own story and in my own process and that I wanted people to be able to come to my page um, on TikTok and on Instagram and be able to know more than just my art I wanted them to be able to know me. Okay. What do you think was the magic behind that one viral video? Um, I was discussing an abusive relationship I had been in. And so it was a video of me creating a table with my dad, which I feel like already had some charm in it because my dad's adorable. Um, but I was also talking about and uh, being abused and coming out of that relationship stronger and knowing my worth more. And I think that it just resonated with lots of people. Um, and I also feel like it was probably a bit shocking, which is usually good in the right context on a social media page, because it was something I hadn't talked about before. It was something I was hesitant to talk about, but it was, um, important to me and I was very passionate about it. So I think the combination of my dad being in it and it being a father daughter experience. Mm. Um, the table was really cool <laughs> and I was really excited about making, uh, it was my first table that I made. And then I was also like discussing a very serious topic and being very transparent and audience and honest with my audience. Uh, so I'm a dad, um, of a boy, but a girl as well. Um, okay. How did he, like if my, how did I can't imagine having that conversation with my daughter without? Yeah, I would know what I would do, but like, how, <laughs> how did how did he how did he take it? Like, what was that like for him to be? Um, so my it? dad is ancient when it comes to social media. Okay. He barely used Facebook, so he has actually never seen that video. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he we we have had that discussion now, but yeah. I didn't that discussion with him till a year or a year and a half after that video, um, where I was finally like, Hey, like <laughs> that guy I brought home a lot. <laughs> this is uh, actually what was happening. Um, and he was great about it. He took it really well. Um, and I explained to him up front cause I told my brother about it and my brother didn't have an, what I would consider an inappropriate response. He just had yeah. a very response. Um, my brother's response was anger and right. I just had to explain to him that like, Hey, like, I understand that you're frustrated at the situation. I am too, but I need you to not make this about yourself because your anger isn't helping me. And so I had to have an honest discussion with my brother about um, 
having a more appropriate reaction. And if he was going to feel that way, just keeping it to himself because it wasn't beneficial to my mental health to experience his anger at the situation. And so I'd already gone through it with my brother. So when I brought it to my dad, I started with that and just explained like, Hey, this is where I am emotionally. And this is where my mental process is. And I would love it if you would share, if I could share this with you in an honest way without being worried that you're going to do something that I'm uncomfortable with or Mm -hmm. say things that aren't beneficial to my mental health. And so I allowed him the space to process in a healthy way and to be honest with his feelings. But I asked that he took that to his wife. Um, and I asked that in my presence, he would just, uh, handle it in a way that was beneficial to my mental health because I wanted to be honest with him and open with him but I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't going to be taking me back any steps in my process. Cause I was yeah. in therapy um, and getting counseling for the abuse. And I wanted, I wanted my family to be a part of the healing process without it being detrimental to the process itself. So I hope you don't mind me asking this question. Um, and if so, just let me know, but you know, okay. there, there may be people out there that hear this and are going through the same thing. Um, what was the thinking process or your internal kind of clock or process that um, you didn't tell your dad, let's say, while it was happening, like in the moment? Mm -hmm. Um, It was just, (laughs) it was so embarrassing that I was allowing uh, that kind of treatment to myself. I was mortified that I had lowered my standards so far to allow a man to, well, a boy to treat me the way that he was. And so I didn't want anyone to know I hid it from everyone except for my like two or three closest best girlfriends. And it was just because I trusted them not to force my hand in any one direction not to abandon me out of frustration of the situation um, and not to take things into their own hands. And I just knew that if I told my anyone in my family while it was happening, that they were going to feel very action led toward the situation. And like, that is so natural and I get it. And I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's very reasonable that my dad would want to go, you know, wring his neck or whatever, but it was not going to be helpful to me in the process because Someone can't leave an abusive, an abusive relationship until they're ready. And there was nothing anyone could have said or done to have gotten me out of that situation before it was my time to leave. Because if someone forced my hand, I would have gone back. And if outside circumstances had changed the situation, I would have gone back. Uh, I had to wait till I was mentally prepared to leave on my own so that it was my decision and it wasn't... Uh, I didn't have the excuse of it being someone else's influence that I left. When you're in that situation, um, are you more afraid of the unknown of leaving of what happens after that than the uh, circumstances that you're in at the moment? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a close friend who's going through a similar situation now. Um, and we've, uh, me and a few friends have been kind of coaching her through it and giving advice, like obviously not forcing her hand in any one way. Cause like I said, that's not beneficial to someone in this situation, but, um, we were really encouraging her to block his number cause she'd left and it was great. She was making awesome progress. And I was like, Hey, like the next step here is blocking his number. And I, I we have a group message of, um, some of us girls and we'd all been talking about it. And I messaged her separately because I'm, I had gone through a similar situation. So I understood a little better what she was going through. And I just said, like, Hey, listen, I know how scary it is to block because then you really don't know what's going to happen. Like, at least if he's going to freak out, he's going to text you and be freaking out on you and like putting that on you. And you're going to be experiencing it lifetime and that's going to suck. But what sucks even more is not having any open communication where if he's spiraling and going to do something bad, you're not going to know till it hits you. And so the unknown is almost the worst part. It's the hardest part to get over, to really move on um, and be able to like fully process and leave the situation. But it's really crucial to be able to just take yourself out of that situation and then cut all ties and make it completely impossible to be contacted Um, because the unknown will be scary, but while you still have any connection, they still have power over you. So the unknown is, is, is more tied to preparing for another episode versus (laughs) the unknown of, am I going to find someone else? Or, you know, I kind of still have feelings for this guy. Okay. Yeah. Well, for, 
for me, that was a bit scary. Um, I also struggled with, and this is actually something I've never talked about on social media. So, cons- <laughs> so I will give you the inside scoop. Um, I, when I was growing up and until very recently, I struggled with my sexuality, not knowing if I was asexual or not. Um, I don't experience sexual attraction in the way that most people do. I've probably only met three people in my entire life that I've been sexually attracted to. And so, um, my ex was one of those. And part of the reason I stayed so long was I was scared that if I left, I'd never see or meet another person that I could feel romantically or sexually attracted to, and therefore wouldn't be able to ever get married or have kids. And so, uh, a lot of my thinking was tied to like, this is my only chance to have the future I always dreamed of. And that kept me in the same place for a long time. Um, and eventually it just got to a point where it was like, I would rather never get married or have kids if the alternative is marrying you and having to have your kids. (laughs) And so, um, so for me, a lot of the fear of the unknown was being afraid that my future was not going to be what I'd always dreamed it would be. And that all of my friends and family would kind of move on without me. Um, cause the natural progression for most people is you get married, you have kids. And then most time, most of the time married couples have married friends and people with kids, like they all have kids and then everybody's doing kid things together. And it was terrifying for me that I would always be the single woman without children that had nothing in common anymore with any of my friends. Um, and it was just like the isolation of that was really scary but I just had to get a point where it was like, okay, like if that is what God intended for me, then I've got to trust that that's just what's going to happen. And I've got to be okay with it because I know that what I'm doing now and what I'm allowing to happen to myself is not what God intended. And that I'm just like blocking him out <laughs> because I don't want to be alone. Yeah. Um, so the fear of being alone was very prominent for me, but there's also a lot of the fear of unknown because you don't know where the other person's head is at and you don't know how to prepare if you don't have any open communication. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, of course. So two things with that. So one, I want to go back to your dad real quick. So I'm, um, so my daughter, she, she'll turn 12 next week. Okay. And Very I just nice. knew from, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I knew from the beginning that the most important relationship that a girl will ever have in their life is their father. Mm -hmm. And that's who they will judge every person that they ever meet, whether it's, you know, um, um, you know, someone that they're going to date or someone that they, you know, a boss, like, you know, you don't, you know, it's that kind of, it's that much of an impactful relationship. So I started reading this book. Um, I believe the actual title is strong father's, and strong daughters, raising strong daughters, I think it is. And one of the stories, uh, it was written by, um, I'm not a big book reader, so I couldn't tell you to save my life, the actual author's name. So I apologize. (laughs) Uh, But I just was riveted by the book and she's a psychologist and she wrote this book after years and years and years of hearing girls talk about (laughs) anything really, but Uh it always kind of led back to the relationship with their dad. So long story short, same kind of situation. A girl was in a, um, um, uh, a, a abusive relationship, and it came up about how her dad, um, her, his reaction to it once she told him. And the moral of that chapter was the father's reaction could have been more destructive than the actual event. Mm-hmm. Because the, if, in this case that she she gave, the father was you know kind of blew it off and didn't wasn't empathetic and didn't even try didn't even do that stereotypical who's this guy let me kick his ass yeah uh, kill him which would have been my reaction um, <laughs> very naturally so I, you know what I I have a hard time letting people even kind of if I see someone even looking weird at my kid I'm like no no no. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so that kind of struck a nerve with me of, okay, how do, how, be mindful of how you react to certain, certain situations that your broader, your daughter brings to you, or in some cases not brings to you in that moment, you know? So Mm -hmm. it sounds like your dad handled that the best way that you needed him to in the moment. He did. Um, And I think possibly he, 
I don't think he knew the full extent, but he knew it wasn't good. Um, I've probably cried in front of my dad like twice in my entire life uh, since, well, pre-puberty. I sure I cried around my dad all the time when I scraped my knees and stuff, but like emotional crying, not like pain crying, uh, very few times. And uh, when me and my ex broke up, like the, I guess the first or second time, uh, he had a dinner party with tons of people there. And I was absolutely fine, or at least I was pretending to be absolutely fine. But you know, you know, that meme where it's like, it's like, oh, are you okay? And then immediately someone like bursts into tears. Sure. He did that um, in front of like a large group of people. <laughs> and I was just immediately a mess and like not like he could very much tell something was wrong with me. Um, and so I think he knew, he knew something was wrong and something wasn't good. And I, when I told him that we had gotten back together, um, which we did several times over several years, he reacted, um, perfectly. He was obviously disappointed, but not saying that to my face. And he just said, you know, I, I trust that you're making the decisions you need to right now. And I support you in whatever you need. Um, which was showing me like he didn't want me in that situation, but he was standing by me in the decision that I was making. And so there wasn't added rejection to it. I was already so self-loathing that I had put myself back in this situation, um, and crawled back to a very evil person. And my dad wasn't then adding rejection on top of that. Like the, the very classic, like, no, you can't do that to yourself. Like, stop it. Like, Oh my God, I'm, I, I just can't even be around you when you do things like this, you know, you're making a mistake. Like I can understand the very human reaction that that is that I received from some people, um, while going through this relationship, but it's so destructive because when you add rejection to an already dangerous situation, what you do is you just chase that person into the arms of their abuser. Um, I understand that, but you also, I, I, I'm assuming that you also know, and maybe you may, there's no way to understand what a dad feels like, you know? Oh yeah. I have no clue. I'm sure it was torture for him. Right, 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 right. You know, knowing that his daughter is going into the arms of someone that's been abusive. I, you God bless your dad. Cause I, um, <laughs> I don't, um, wow. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I just, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you in a little bit of my world. You know, <clears throat> my daughter's turning 12, like, like I said, next week. And I don't know, in one of my podcasts, it was with Frankie Orange, tat- world famous tattoo artist a couple months ago. He, I'm, and I, I had lunch with him last week and I blamed him for this. Um, <laughs> he mentioned in the podcast, oh yeah, around, you know, 12, 13, you know, somewhere around, how old's your daughter again? He's like, yeah, it's going to happen soon. Um, <laughs> yep. you know, hang out in the room and you're not really come out only for dinner and I'll be damned. Uh-huh. Like two weeks after that podcast we recorded, it happened. And I'm like cursing his name. I yelled at him last week for it, but um, we've been dealing with that lately. And I have a hard time not taking it personally because we are very, very close. And, um, and I just kind of, I don't know. I've been thinking, I don't know how to handle this anymore. There's no book. I mean, ironically, (laughs) I'm reading a book about it, but like, even so I don't feel like it's giving me advice from my situation. Yeah, it's more down. personal than a book can put into words. Yeah, and I just sat down next to her. Like, she was playing a video game, and I just pulled up a chair, sat down next to her. I'm like, listen, I, I got to talk to you about something. <laughs> and uh, and she always puts her head down when she thinks she's getting a lesson from dad, but she just looked uh-huh. at me. And uh, my eyes started to water up, and I'm like, listen, oh. um, this is the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. <laughs> and I've done some, I've, I've, I've lived quite the life but being your dad right now and having to let go and let you hang out in your room and not do stuff with me and and you know knowing that you want to ride that roller coaster with someone else and not me i said it's literally killing me but, yeah um i i know i have to and um you know all i'm asking is that you don't shut me out that's the only thing yeah. i ask you know and yeah. you know, I, she, I my eyes were watering, and I looked at her, and she never locked unlocked contact with me, which is have, hasn't been normal lately. And yeah. her eyes were starting to water up, and she's gonna kill me for this. But I walked away from there, going, "Okay, we had a moment. She understands where I'm coming yeah. from. That was nice." <laughs> yeah, I cannot explain to you how close we are. But, yeah, um, I'm very, I'm very much a dad's girl. Like okay. I 
uh, me and my dad have always been very close and like we had a rocky patch um when he made some major mistakes earlier in my life but like we stayed very close and it was like i am pretty i'm pretty open with my family especially now like i'm an adult um but yeah. i also didn't experience what you're experiencing with your daughter and neither did my dad because i was unknowingly to myself at that age experiencing asexuality and i had zero interest in boys boys did not exist to me they were nothing <laughs> so my dad got super easy ride in high school because he he we went um so i had one boyfriend in high school and he um he actually later ended up being interested in men uh, so both of us were very confused at that point and he was super sweet oh my god i loved him to death i still love him to death we're still really close friends um and my dad took us on a trip to new york and got us our own separate hotel room together <laughs> that poor that we were not having sex or anything close to it he was so positive that i was not sexually attracted to that man that he got us our own hotel room and you know what we did not a damn thing <laughs> i, got, I gotta um, meet this dad of yours he oh sounds, he's, he's he funny. sounds like a blast i love him, dad. <laughs> uh, the joke of my story is i walked away going all right we had this moment you know i'm gonna give her some space and maybe that will make her come back to me you know that kind of mm -hmm. thing and i'll be damned i go upstairs she's gonna kill me i hope she doesn't listen to this i went upstairs <laughs> i shouldn't say this but i went upstairs to say good night knock on her door she's laying there with her phone watching something and mm -hmm. i lay in bed next to her i'm like oh what are you watching and nothing i didn't hear anything nothing and i'm like oh um what, what are you watching nothing and i'm like <laughs> uh, hello what are you watching she goes uh it's obvious i'm watching iron man and I'm like, well, obviously Iron Man's not on the screen right now. So how would I know that? And <laughs> like, oh, and then it was just that, you know, and then like, yeah. all right. So tomorrow's last day of school for the year. What time's this? What time's that? And it was just kind of like pulling teeth. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go now. <laughs> She's like, well, what did I do? I'm like, nothing. That's the whole point, but that's cool. And I walked out and I, and I, and it, on the others, it's like a movie moment. I shut the door and I stand there at the other side of the door going, wow, that conversation this morning meant absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you did have a movie moment. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that I, thought, it, I love I, how it meant so much to you. And you were like, I, we poured into each other's souls. And she heard what I was saying, even the things I didn't say. And she was like, dad interrupted my video game. <laughs> and all I could think about was finishing this level. <laughs> Yeah, oh break my, my heart. But, you, know, you wake up and try it again the next day. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I, honestly, I feel like I have no advice because I have not been a father and I have not had a normal uh, puberty experience with boys. Um, but I think, let's see, the thing that made me the most um, willing to be transparent with my dad about everything, even outside of boys, uh, was just that he always had appropriate reactions. So. Yeah. The first time your daughter gets in trouble for um, drinking or, oh, a big thing that my parents did that made me comfortable was my mom told me if I wanted to, um, like, if I was interested in boys, she was like, please be honest with me so we can make sure you're safe. If that's the decision you're going to make, I hope that you'll listen to my advice about it and maybe wait. But if you're not going to anyways please let me take you to the store so we can, we can make sure that you're having safe sex. And if you want to experiment with drugs, please do it at the house so that if you get in danger, I can help you or take you to the hospital. If you want to drink, you're, you're getting anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is not 12. This is later, but she always told me, she was like, if you're out drinking somewhere and need a ride home, if you get in a dangerous situation, you can call me for a ride and call me to help you. And I promise you will not be in trouble for the drinking. Sure. Like you have a freebie. So that was a big deal for me growing up and made it where anytime I was in trouble, I was calling my parents instead of continuing to be in dangerous situations, um, for like, you know, alcohol and things. And yeah. I didn't really do drugs, but I uh, started drinking in college and knew I could always call my parents if I needed to. So well, there you go. Trust is making sure that your kids know that if they need help, you can be the first call. Yeah. And uh, can I still tell them I'm going to kill whoever bothers them? Is that still off the table? Um, I would, I would, even if you mean it, I would say it in a joking way. Cause that's what my dad did. My dad. What if I kill them and not tell her that I did it and be like, oh, I, I had nothing yeah. to do with that. Hey, as long as you don't get caught, I I think that's great. I should put this on tape right now. Um, 
<laughs> All right, so <laughs> moving out of that, so a couple <laughs> weeks ago, if I remember correctly, you posted some stories of a boyfriend. Oh, yes. Right? I, Am I right? I did. I did. I have a... Um, absolutely so is this number three or four person that you're attracted to? Uh, so he is the third. Um, okay. And it was... he. He's actually been my upstairs neighbor for about two years and uh -oh. um, i did not experience any attraction to him <laughs> until uh like right before we started dating we started hanging out more kind of in groups because we're neighbors and um we have a bunch of people in my building that are all the same age and we all started hanging out and um we just I don't know. I just, something switched and I was like, Oh, I think it was actually that my attraction is changing to where like going through an abusive relationship made it where I am attracted now to kindness. Yeah. <laughs> and he is just the most pure, I call him golden retriever boy because he is the human embodiment of a golden retriever. He is Interesting. just, so, so he doesn't have a hairy back. He does not have a hairy back. I'm okay. uh, grateful for that. But he just like, I walk in the room and the smile that comes onto his face makes me feel like I am the best thing on this planet to him. Um, and I think genuinely I am the best thing on the planet to him and he is to me. So it's very, uh, we've only been dating like four months, I guess. Um, uh, yeah. but it's very pure. It's very happy. It's very healthy. Um, and he, I've been very open with him about my experiences. So he knows what I've been through and how it still impacts me. And, um, you know, I told him, I was like, I'm never, I went to counseling specifically so that I would never take the damage someone else put on me into a new relationship. I didn't want to ever be the girl that, you know, like I know a lot of people that get cheated on or, you know, get abused. They then take that onto their next partner with suspicion and, can't trust anyone and are constantly fearful. And like, I told him, I was like, sometimes I deal with those things, but I will never put that on you. Um, you will never be the victim of something that somebody else did to me. So yeah. that's we smart. Are that's mature happy. and smart. Cause most girls will not take that approach. Most girls will yeah. punish the dude they're with just because, you know, somebody. Did yeah. That. And just be scared of everyone. Um, and I, I knew that I didn't want that to be me very early on. And so I made sure that it wasn't going to be, and now we are in a very healthy, happy relationship. And he so there, there's this Van Halen song that talks about aliens, you know, and it <laughs> okay. talks about like all of a sudden something changes and, and you feel different. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. That was, that was exactly what happened. I was like, this is just my neighbor. Um, love, we love walked in. There you go. Yeah, we occasionally went to church together uh, and stuff. And then we were hanging out one night and, oh, I think we were playing like a drinking game or something. And we had to hold a um, playing card between our noses. Oh, and then, there you go. And I was like super close to his face. We didn't kiss or anything, but I like that feeling in your like chest, like the bubbles. And you're, I was like, oh, oh, I was, like, fuzzies. Yeah, I got the fuzzies. I got it's, the. It's the, the old fuzzies. card between the nose trick. He's pretty good at this guy. Yeah, all the single listeners out there, if you uh, would like to your neighbor fall in love with you, um, put a uh, ace of spades between your nose and see how it goes. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's my next question. It's the biggest question of the day, I think. How okay. Is, it, is he still love upstairs? He does. Yeah. How does that work? Like, how do you get um, <laughs> your space, and how do you make sure he's not always over? No offense to him if he's listening, but like, oh no, he's not here. How, I'm, how I'm does here. that happen? How does that um, work? Yeah. So that we were both worried about that when we first started dating. He even told me he was like, "I'm breaking one of my rules. Like, I have a rule that I don't date neighbors." And I was like, "I live 20 feet from you." <laughs> that um, must have, by the way, that must have meant something bad happened before you. Oh yeah, I asked him. I was like, "Did you date a neighbor before?" He's like, "Yeah, in college, he dated one of his like dorm mates or whatever, or, like on his hall, and it was atrocious." Oh, so it's not a good thing. Um yeah, so both of our like top love languages are quality time, and Ooh. so I have not yet minded to be suffocated by him. <laughs> um, it does not feel suffocating. I'm sure eventually we will get sick of each other and ask for some space, but yeah. I think so. He goes out of town pretty frequently maybe like two weekends out of the month um but i think we've spent every day together since we started dating which has cool. definitely made me a little fast but um if the advice you're seeking is how to maintain good boundaries and space while living and dating your neighbor i have no advice for you <laughs> we are glued to each other <laughs> uh so yeah we are we're preparing for guests to come in town and i was cleaning up my room and i did laundry and i was like half of 
this is yours. Um, how uh, did this happen? <laughs> you know, I, like, I just did all of your laundry because you like left your swim trunks and you're like, he'll work out and come and like change and shower here and then leave all of his clothes here. I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> you live upstairs, take your clothes. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, land, land on the law down there in Charlotte. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. All right. So big question I have is yeah. especially, and I think this is really maybe applicable to you and it it might sound like well i'm just going to ask it and you can take it where you want to what has been your biggest failure that led to a breakthrough mm, um that's a good question i feel like i had i don't feel like i've had huge failures um but i have had some uh little ones back to back to back to back that have been so frustrating that it like propelled me into success um i think that early on i was I was just more focused on, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. So I failed early on with social media because I was having my guard up. Um, I wasn't as dedicated to it as I could have been. And I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and so like, I didn't have very good exposure. And then I had that video go viral and I didn't know how to maintain the success. Um, and so I was like, Oh my gosh, I have like overnight, I'd had like 3000 TikTok followers and then I had a million and like my Instagram had gone up by like 30,000 or 40,000 or something. And I was like, okay, um, what now? How do I like keep this up? And for a while I failed because I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I failed to remember that my greatest asset is literally Google. And so, uh, after like a few weeks of then not having the same success and feeling kind of down on myself that like, Oh, I, I accidentally did this. I had to kind of take a step back and realize like, okay, no, I didn't accidentally go viral. The intention is always to have social media success. It was just that that time it worked. And I had to take a closer look at uh, my social media patterns and kind of do some self research and then do some Googling and just kind of figure it out. Like I put in the time to research my, you know, field, I guess you would call it. Um, and how to be a successful social media presence. And it was, it was really just, it wasn't a lack of dedication. It was a lack of common like knowledge on my part. And I was just like failing to remember that I could Google how to do this better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I ended up doing some research, um, asking some help from my fellow makers in the community, and then taking a deeper look into what had done well for me in the past and picking out the common denominators and then turning that into more consistent success. So I knew that being transparent and personal was beneficial. I knew that having interesting, um, constantly changing content, but within a category that could be consistent was important because usually, so some artists will do a little bit of everything. And the problem with that is that if you're doing 10 different styles of art or 10 different themes, then someone might see one of your videos on their discover page, be like, Oh my gosh, I love that. And they follow you. But if that's only one out of their 10, like different things that they're doing, then they're only going to like one out of 10 posts that you put up. And so you have to have a niche down enough, uh, content reel that people are going to like everything you put out, but you also have to have enough diversity that people don't feel like they're seeing the same thing in every, um, yeah. post that you put up. So like, that's why all my stuff is oceans because my fan base, my media base is all based off of ocean loving artists, people. Um, but then I will make olive boards and little ring dishes and tables, and I will collect sand from different beaches and I will show the woodworking process and show the wave making process. And it's just, it's learning to be consistent while also diversifying and then keeping a healthy balance of, I am transparent enough with my community that they understand me, like me and are invested in me, but I'm also private enough for my own benefit that I am not feeling suffocated or overexposed to the people that I am asking to invest in me. So I know how I felt, but I'd love to get your take. When you started getting new followers, what did that feel like to see these new people looking at your stories and you not know them? Um, it was extremely overwhelming. Um, partially because one of the first things that went viral was that content on being abused and uh, I think 
TikTok was just like out to get me and immediately sent that out to all his family members. And so, um, um, yeah, so I ended up causing me a bit of drama and I just kind of had to take it in stride. And I was like, well, I didn't lie. So <laughs> sorry that you're offended by the truth, but that is what yeah. it is. Um, but it was also a strange transition to be like, okay, like I have this very public life now, um, but I can make it as private as I want to. So like, it was really just a process of learning boundaries and it was flattering while also feeling overwhelming. And, um, it was exciting that I had all these different possibilities while also being, um, a bit scary that possibly I'd fail or possibly that I would just not have what I thought I did going for me. Um, so it was, it was definitely a mix of emotions. It was a mixed bag, but I kind of had a decent amount of confidence in myself at that point, which was totally misplaced because I had no clue what I was doing, but I was feeling very confident for being an amateur. And I was like, you know what? Like I can do this and I can make it work. And I feel, I felt like I had enough logical business savvy and social media knowledge that I was like, like with this as a foundation of like naturally, kind of knowing what to do, I can do enough research and like dedicate enough of my time to this that I could, I could make this work. For me, it felt that my account became not personal anymore. And I don't say like a personal account via via a business account, but all of a sudden I didn't know these people that were mm-hmm. asking me questions, yeah. You know, because when you when you first start these, you know, get on these platforms, it's just you, you know, with friends. And I just yeah. I just found that to be a weird kind of experience until you start having personal dialogue with those people. So, mm-hmm. All right, yeah, what's I, been the what's been the strangest thing someone wanted you to put waves on? Um, someone asked me to do the hood of their car, Ooh. and. I had to say no because it won't stick to metal like that, first of all. And then I have to permanently damage the car to make it stick to it. Okay. Uh, and epoxy resin uh, over time reacts with UV exposure. And so, like, if you have a car parked outside, like, over a couple years, it's going to yellow the white in it. And so, like, for my indoor art pieces, because I... I pretty much exclusively make indoor art. That's not going to be a problem, but for a car <laughs> that's going to be outside for most of its life, that would impact it. Um, and I explained that to him and he was like, no, man, just do it. And I was like, no, <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So whenever you can, you know, I have asked you before about guitars, how would that mm-hmm. work? Like, so for instance, I'm looking at this guy, would this essentially be the guitar? And like, there would be part of the guitar that's, um, you know, exposed wood. And then, Mm -hmm. okay. So the big question I have is, does this stuff crack? So I mean, if you, (laughs) I need to give you a guitar blank, basically, where everything ideally is pre-drilled. So when I drill into this at various spots, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, So you can drill and cut into resin without it shattering. If you took that board right now over your head on a balcony and threw it onto like pavement as hard as you could, it would probably fracture. Um, But it would take a lot. (laughs) It's, it's not, it's not a very fragile medium, so it would be pretty durable. Um, I do think over time, the if uh, if the resin was where your pick strokes would be, it wouldn't. I wouldn't say it would scratch it necessarily, but eventually it would dull the surface in that area. Okay. Uh, All right. But yeah, well, I also had really I had a strange request from someone too, and I actually don't mind these requests. I haven't. Um, I've only done one of these projects before and I don't take them on very often just because of the delicate nature of them. But I do have people often ask me to make art incorporating ashes, um, of in them. So I did do, I did do one of those. Um, I did a tray with ashes mixed into the sand, um, and a beach scape cause they spread her ashes on that beach and brought back some of the sand and mixed it with her ashes. Um, which those are always very sweet, very sentimental pieces. Um, but, very delicate and I hesitate to take them on because it is such an emotional experience for people that like yeah. if it doesn't come out exactly how they envisioned, um, you know, like I'm, I don't want to mess up someone's ashes. <laughs> uh, and so, <laughs> I wouldn't want to touch the ashes. Yeah. Yeah. I wear gloves, but I, <laughs> I do hesitate to take those on, but those are also some of the stranger requests that I get. Um, and yeah. I probably, at least one of those a month. Um, people ask wow. me to do work with ashes. That's crazy. So I, I love your work. There's this guy 
uh, Burl's art. I would love to see you guys collaborate. I don't know how it would happen though, in terms of what you do. He does the exact <laughs> opposite of what you do. Um, you you kind of treat the epoxy almost as the paint, right? I mean, is yeah. that a fair way to describe it? Okay. Yeah. He makes guitars out of basically uh, some okay crayons, right? And he mil- makes a makes a, a mold puts crayons in it and then pours the epoxy over, which kind of, I guess, solidifies everything. And now yeah. obviously you wouldn't think about making guitar out of, you know, crayons, but it works because of the epoxy. Mm-hmm. How does that work? Does it, the epoxy get, it gets in there and it becomes kind of like the skeleton of the crayons or whatever. Um, and- so I guess it just, it would just coat the outsides. It couldn't penetrate crayons. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I, you said his name. I looked him up. I'm on his Instagram right now. His stuff looks really cool. Um, he's definitely very talented. So if he's using epoxy integrated with this stuff, which I see he's made like Burl, um, guitar rivers before, which looks amazing. I don't know how it would work with the crayons. I also think these are colored pencils, not crayons. Um, See, I, but he's made it out of, I mean, the crate, what did he make? And he's just made epoxy guitars, just like clear guitars. I want to oh, see you guys collab on that like river guitar and then yeah. you make it look like it's moving. Oh, that'd be awesome. That's just my suggestion between you two guys. You guys work it out yourself, but <laughs> I'm fans of both of you. Um, <laughs> you have, before I let you go, I've got two more questions. Um, your artistic process, what inspires you? What, do you have music cranking in the background? <laughs> So I have, yeah, always, like, what is it? I am always listening to murder podcasts. Um, what, I'm what a now? murder podcasts. I'm a big uh, true crime person. Oh, so okay. I am uh, no music cranking, but I am always cranking uh, horribly gory stories about murder and kidnapping and all that. So, <laughs> uh, so while I'm peacefully making the waves, um, <laughs> you can be sure that I was listening about some like four year old getting slaughtered. So that, that brings- is a whole other podcast episode right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we could bring on a psychologist to figure out what's going on there, but. Uh, that is, I'm, I'm obsessed with true crime. I, it's a recent obsession, like within the past like year or two. And that is all I listen to when I paint now, um, is all right, true so crime. So just, here's, here's just an easy question for you to answer. Yes or no. Okay. Have you ever thought about how to kill someone and get away with it? Oh yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. I, I've even thought about how to kill someone and then cast them in resin so oh. that the body would not be found. There would be no like, uh, like decay or well, i mean it would decay but it would decay in a controlled environment where it can't leak um so yeah no i've definitely put some wouldn't that be something <laughs> if you did that and then the detectives came over to your house for whatever reason to ask you questions and like you had cheese on the olive board and they're literally <laughs> eating the cheese off of the person they're investigating yeah i'm like oh don't you love it it's so pretty right the sculpture i have in my house that we do in <laughs> Yeah, just a sculpture. Yes, I have, like you have something in your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I think that any good true crime buff has definitely listened to um, a true crime story and thought, oh, I would have gotten away with that. <laughs> or like, I wouldn't have made that mistake. So I definitely, I have never seriously considered killing anyone. But if I had to, <laughs> I think I could, and I could probably get away with it. Wow. Well, there's the news <laughs> right there. Um, there it is. Bring this right, out. Last- Last question. How can people find you on social? Oh, I do. No, another question. Um, okay. You said something about being transparent with your process. Has that mm-hmm. opened the door up for competitors? Because I know there are other people out there. You're the best. Um, but <laughs> I know there. Just, like, how do you deal with c- competition? And you can answer that with you have a, um, I don't know what you call it. Is it a podcast, a YouTube show where you what? have other makers? Mm-hmm. talk about um, stuff so do you yeah. embrace competition like how's that work so we have a phrase we say community over competition and i definitely struggled with this early on um because i could tell that people were using my page less as a place to admire art and buy things it's more as a place to learn and then make their own which inherently is nothing wrong with it but looking from an income standpoint it's not beneficial to me and to my uh, piling up of bills. And so I definitely struggled with that early on, but had to kind of switch my mentality because there's nothing you can do about it. First of all, there's no way that you can stop someone from ripping off your art. Um, and then on top of that, I also had to look at it as like, okay, the people that are doing this are probably people that were in the exact same situation I am and are just trying to like 
either enjoy the making art process or they're just they, they need to pay their bills so i switched my mentality up and we started the maker meetup as a free resource for people to come and learn about how to run their own businesses how to start um small businesses as artists and how to do it successfully and hopefully achieve some financial freedom and so um i definitely used to worry more about it. I don't worry about it anymore. Um, it still does get frustrating sometimes when people will message me and ask me like, Hey, can you give me a step-by-step -step and like your full material list? Which first of all, I have on my website available for people. Oh, so wow. obviously have not done any research or they would have seen that I have, uh, my full material list already on my website for people to like be able to go and find the links directly to where I buy it. But it does still get frustrating, but I don't let it get to me personally. And I love being a resource for people to come and learn how to do the same thing I did. Like I turned a hobby into a full-time business in, you know, less than a year. And I love that that inspires people. And I like to be a resource to people where they feel like they feel safe enough to come and learn from me. Um, because it wasn't like I wasn't like I was a social media, uh, guru or anything. I just kind of accidentally stumbled into it and was able to make it work. So I, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, have you it's utilized cool. like Patreon or any of those services at all. Um, so on the maker meetup, we have Patreon and okay. we do, we do a, a thing called happy half hour where every Tuesday people can come on to a live zoom with us and we all make cocktails and just hang oh, out. Cool. Um, but other than that, I personally don't have a Patreon and I have thought about it. It's probably something I'll do in the future, but not something I'm doing right now. And I will be eventually coming out with a tutorial on how to make cells. Um, that'll be sometime later this year, but I haven't, I don't have that out yet, but all of I my, I want to see you when I go to like Michael's with my kids, I want to see you with a product. Is that in the works? Uh, so maybe, um, I am coming out and this is, this is, this has not been officially announced yet. So how many people do you have listened to your podcast? Usually? Uh, you know what? I'm getting a couple, uh, a couple big news <laughs> items here today. Exclusives. I'm just oh. feeling good today. Um, so I do have my own, uh, pigment brand coming out. Um, the white pigments that make the cells. I do have my own okay. thing launched later this year. And so I will be launching a tutorial alongside it to uh, teach people how to use it and how to make cells like I do. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to help you out right now. When we okay. were talking about you thinking about killing people, I'm okay. just going to maybe suggest when you were <laughs> thinking about who those people were, it may have been competitors. So <laughs> just for those people that are asking for the, um, you know, y y your information, just think about that when you're yeah, yeah. about you making want to waves. Remember, just remember that I love to have um, human sized sculptures in my garden. <laughs> Well, listen, I have enjoyed this com conversation. I think you're an inspiration for those that are, you know, thinking about their own mental health issues and, and situations. I didn't know we were going to talk about that, but that's awesome. And neither did I. Yep. <laughs> Here we um, go. Um, and you're an inspiration in terms of just find, especially over the last year where people were forced to not, you know, not work. Mm -hmm. And it's proof that you can create a business and something that you're passionate about, most importantly, and make money yeah. from that. I think that's awesome. And yeah. most importantly, the, the, my podcast is called Making Waves, and you literally, make waves. <laughs> literally make waves. Thank you for filling that up. So I appreciate you being on. It was an awesome conversation. I've been looking forward to this for yeah. a while. Thank you and, so much uh, for having me. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. And um, hopefully we'll talk soon, and we can maybe work out something with the guitar or something. And Yeah, add, yeah. Add I would the, love add to do it behind me. Project. Absolutely. I would love that. And good luck um, with the 12 year old as you oh, head into puberty. I yeah. know that super fun for you for the next few years. I might have to hide this episode. I said too much. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure you just bury it somewhere so she can't listen to it or be like, oh, babe, I'm sorry. I, I actually canceled the podcast. I'm not doing it. Oh, Ronnie was so boring. You don't want to listen to that one. <laughs> yeah. You just really sucked the whole time. Oop. My dog's uh, we're, we're great. We're great. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk real soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank All you right. so much. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you want to learn anything more about myself or the podcast, go to makingwavespodcast.com. This episode has been produced by the Blue Wave Video Production Agency. You can check them out at, which is my company, check us out at thebluewave.net 
You can find this episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Google Podcasts. Uh, what else? We're everywhere. YouTube. So I hope you come back. We got some really cool guests coming up and uh, see you soon. Thank you.